Welcome back to another video. Today we are going to be talking about the Paradise Flying Snake, Chrysopelea paradisi, a snake that I've been working with for quite some time. Very challenging animal to work with in captivity, but I have had success. You'll have to excuse me on this particular trail. It's a little rough. I'm gonna have to kind of watch my step. I'm in a different area. Wanted to give you guys a different look at some different forest here. So kind of headed out and I'm in a different spot. Now they are a very thin snake of lighter build, only about three feet. And sometimes you'll come across like a big girl, about four feet or so, but normally they kind of average about three feet, three and a half feet, something like that. Now, Paradisi are known for the red dots down their back. They don't all look like that. They don't all retain those red dots into adulthood, but they're still very beautiful even without the red. They have a green, yellow, or gold kind of base color. Very, very beautiful snake. Once they get moving at a, at a good clip, a good speed, it kind of becomes a blur. It's kind of hard to explain unless you've seen it before, but really, really beautiful snake. One of the most beautiful snakes, in my opinion, in Southeast Asia. Now, babies and young animals, at least from my experience, will always have the red color. At some point, they may lose the red color or they may retain it into adulthood. Also, based on my experience, males will be the ones usually retaining that red color into adulthood and females are more prone to losing the red color, but I have had some beautiful adult females high red. So it's really hard to say, but that seems to be kind of the general consensus from what I've seen. Now these snakes are very arboreal and they are sight hunters. Their eyesight is unbelievable. So they're diurnal, they'll be active during the daytime, and if they see something that moves that they wanna eat, they will relentlessly chase after it. Lizards and that sort of thing, I have seen them really give chase. It's an amazing thing to see. Also in captivity, put some fast moving prey into a cage and watch them go to work. It's pretty amazing. Very, very accurate with their bites. They know where to grab animals and how to quickly maneuver prey into their mouths, like head first and stuff is amazing thing. Now in the wild, they will eat mostly lizards and geckos, but they will eat amphibians. They will eat some mammals, fledgling birds out of nests. Obviously the snakes are very small. So for mammal prey, you're talking about baby mice and that sort of thing out of maybe a nest. And there are shrews here that even as an adult size, they're very, very tiny. So pretty much anything that's small enough to be consumed, they will go after it. Now, do they have the ability to fly? Yes and no. It was something that I would more call a glide. They have the ability to flatten out their bodies. When they do flatten out their bodies, their ventral side becomes concave. So it becomes kind of like a scoop. So they are very, very confident in their ability to glide. So they will launch themselves off at very high distances and then they will flatten out and then kind of start moving in an S fashion. And the higher they are, the more forward motion that they will get. But um, even when you're holding them, like they're constantly trying to launch themselves out of your grasp. Now, when they flatten out, the sides of their bodies become very, almost like sharp. And they use that to actually climb vertical surfaces like trees and things. And they can get really, really good grip on textured surfaces by flattening out and manipulating the ribs. This is a rear fanged genus which basically means that they do have toxins in their saliva. And my experience is every nip is going to immediately go into a chew. Now the chew is what's going to get toxins under your skin. So I recommend that if one does give you a nip, disconnect it right away. Do not sit there and video it for your own amusement because it's probably not gonna be fun. Um, they go right into a chew and they just start getting it in. And because these snakes are diurnal, they are going to be active during the daytime. And at nighttime, you probably are going to most commonly come across them up off the ground in treetops, coiled up 
asleep. So you, if you're spotlighting at night with a light, you're gonna see that, that white ventral belly or yellow belly from the ground. So I saw my very first paradise flying snake at the facility in Malaysia in 2008. And shortly thereafter, I had imported my first ones and it's kind of off to the races to figure them out from that point forward. Now, because they are very thin and have a very slight build, it is very important to hydrate those animals. I did this with direct spraying and misting. It kind of promotes drinking. And it was very important that I did this right away upon arrival. And then even under normal conditions, I would spray them about two or three times a week directly and it really helped a lot with keeping those animals hydrated. So for caging, I recommend something tall that's heavily decorated or planted, lots of branches for climbing, and a day light is pretty important to keep those guys active. At night, of course, lights out just like in nature, but during the day, some nice bright lighting to simulate the sun is pretty beneficial. It keeps those animals very active and alert. Now for diet, that's a little bit controversial, I guess. Most hobbyists, they want the easy way out and just straight up jump to like mouse pinkies or whatever. These are mostly gonna be lizard feeders. My opinion is that they do best on lizards, especially younger animals, baby animals. I wouldn't wanna give them mammal type prey at the small size. It seems, at least from my experience, that adult animals do a lot better uh, with handling some rodent prey, but still a varied diet, I think even into adulthood, is very important. But hammering small size animals or very young animals with mammals is probably not a very good idea. Now, feeding new animals, these guys really key up on movement. So. My go-to is going to be live house geckos or lizards in the beginning. Once they get acclimated and start feeding really well, you can switch them over to frozen thought of the same thing, offered on the end of tweezers, kind of shaking them around to give a little movement and get them excited. And then it goes back again to what I said about the size of the animal. If you want to vary the diet, you want to add in some mice or a day-old quail, just shake them on the end of tweezers and usually those bigger animals will have no problems. Now, you can feed them one or two times per week. I prefer frequent meals, but smaller in size. So really, optimal for me would be two times a week on small meals. They have very high metabolisms and digest food very, very fast. So smaller meals kind of uh, work best for an animal like that twice a week, and I think you're good to go. Now, these are not good snakes for handling. They are very high energy. They are sometimes very prone to biting. The rear fang thing can be a concern as well. And stress, when you're holding on to them, all they wanna do is launch themselves out of your hands. So I recommend no handling. They're really an amazing animal to keep in captivity, very active uh, climbing and that sort of thing. They're not nocturnal, so you won't, uh, it won't be an animal that hides all day and then is active at night. So pretty good stuff with that. In my experience, uh, no problems housing them in groups, but of course feeding can get a little bit sketchy. So you have to kind of be careful if you're gonna do a group or a pair or whatever. One animal per cage is probably the easiest to manage in my opinion. So I first bred these in 2013 from some very well-established wild-caught adults. I bred them a couple times afterward, uh, different animals in fact, but my go-to on them was pretty much to reduce meals to one per week, one small meal per week. I did this in the winter time. If no follicles are present, I'm basically doing the food reduction in the female for about six or seven weeks and Afterwards, I'm going to increase the frequency of the meals even to two or three times per week, just small meals, of course, and I'm gonna start introducing the male at that time. Now, I'm always talking about feeling for follicles, right? So this is also something that I'm constantly doing. I check them about once every two weeks or so, just real quick, non-invasive, just a real fast feeling with my fingers. And if I feel follicles, it's time to pair right away. But if I don't feel follicles, 
I basically just kind of introduce a male here and there as I'm going along. But if not, I'm just doing the, the reduction in food for about six weeks or so in the winter time. And then I kind of start the pairing from there. Pair them in between meals. Uh, once the food reduction is over with and I get back into uh, increasing the meals, I will pair females throughout. So I basically just separate to feed and I put them together. So my clutches were averaging about eight or so in number. And when I incubated eggs, I was doing them at 80 or 81 degrees, and it would take those eggs about 90 days to hatch. Now the babies that came out of the eggs were beautiful, lots of red, all of them, and they were super robust, very active and alert, really, really pretty little baby snakes. So raising and establishing the babies, that is a bit challenging. They're not something that you can just go run and grab some day old pinks for. You need to be prepared, be prepared with lizards. If you're raising your own house geckos or small anoles or something along those lines, you'll be good to go. Morning geckos is another one that I hear a lot of people talking about. I had a huge colony of house geckos and I was collecting eggs and those little eggs were hatching constantly and I would just hold all the babies. So I was basically not only raising snakes, but I was raising house geckos for feeders. The babies would take those readily, no problem. In fact, after a short period of time when the babies were starting to really get hungry and established, I could have really good luck offering those animals food on the end of tweezers, even to the point where I was able to do house gecko tails, um, just kind of jiggle them a little bit on the end of tweezers and those babies would actually get after it. So my final thoughts on flying snakes. Chrysopelea in general are not a very easy snake to work with, but if you have experience establishing wild caught animals, you probably will get to breeding, you probably will get to egg laying, and you probably will even get to hatching babies. But if you are not prepared to get those babies started with lizard prey, you're gonna have a rough time of it. I know from experience, the first time for me was kind of a disaster. The second and third time I did it, things were smooth as could be because I was prepared. So if you have done this already, I congratulate you. You are definitely an advanced keeper. So just another species highlight video, speaking from experience, working with some very obscure animals. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Thank you so much for watching. Be safe and we will see you in the next one. Take care.